at your, the description of your talk mm -hmm. that we're going to learn about bad practices, mm -hmm. which might be best practices. So let's give Roy a round of applause. Mm. Right. right, so yeah, we're going to talk today about best practices. So best practices are basically kind of like these informal rules that we keep in our head when we're developing software and when we're doing code reviews. And we don't learn them by reading this like, huge book of Swiss best practices. We kind of pick them up as we go along. Uh, we get them from watching dub dub sessions, looking at sample code, following people on Twitter and seeing what the conversation is in the community, like listening to podcasts, reading blog posts, maybe like programming books, and then like the mistakes that we make. This is what we learn from. So today's talk, we're going to have this kind of like deep dive and a journey through seven different best practices in Swift. And then we'll zoom out and look at the bigger picture and what best practices actually are. Um, disclaimer, there are a lot of opinions in this talk and some things that you may disagree with. Uh, I think that's okay, but just, just so you know, I'm, I'm aware of this. And yeah, we're going to look at best practices with the Swift lens. Cool. Let's get started. So seven best practices. The first one that I want to discuss with you today is to never force unwrap. So force unwrapping is quite unpopular. There are a lot of articles telling you that it should be banned, that you should never use it, it's wrong. Avoid it as much as possible. It's also banned by many style guides. And if you're using things like Swift Lint or any linters, that's usually one of the default linters that you get to not force unwrap your Swift code. So what does Swift unwrapping do? It's basically a way uh, force unwrapping does. It's you unwrap an optional that should never be nil. It's a way for you to tell uh, Swift this should never be nil. Um, it could be that it's like an auth token that you never expect to be nil, and in that case, look, what, what should you do? Or maybe if you're working with payments, maybe the payment didn't work or data corruption. But basically, when you're telling the system that it's better to crash than present something, it's because your system entered an undefined state. So yeah, you might crash. Um, how we force unwrap is very easy. You just have an exclamation point. And what will happen if there is nil there, you'll get this error saying that fatal error, unexpectedly found nil while unwrapping an optional value. And the reason a lot of people have issues with this is that this is not very useful. And it's very easy to do something else and to have like a god let and provide your own message with a fatal error. And what you'll get in the console is something a lot more useful. Uh, so in this case, we can say if the token is nil, you, we can say you must supply a token. And that's more useful for the developer. This kind of pattern is so popular that it was suggested that it might be added to the language. So there was a proposal in Swift Evolution to add a bang bang symbol and wrap or die. And it would have looked like this. So you have bang bang and then the exp um, explanation. Uh, this was ultimately rejected, but the conversation around it was very interesting. And it turned out that this is like a problem for a lot of Swift developers. So we said that. The alternative is providing a good error message, but what if you can't provide a good error message? What if you don't really know why this thing is nil, or there could be like a million reasons why it's nil? Is there really a difference between God let fatal error with saying number should never be nil and just force unwrapping? In my opinion, there isn't. Like this is pretty much equivalent. So we could take this rule that we should never force unwrap and maybe expand it a little bit and say that you should never force unwrap when you can provide a useful error message that will help you in development in the future. Another issue is UIKit has a lot of failable initializers. And uh, URL uh, with string is, uh, returns an optional, UI image as well. And when will this be nil? It will be nil when you've made a mistake during development time, when you've made a typo. So if you made a typo, you want to know about it as quickly as possible and catch it before it reaches production. So my recommendation in this case will be to also force unwrap, but make sure that you have tests that kind of touch that path so you will get this really fast feedback loop. Another alternative will be to use some kind of tools like SwiftGen and get type safe enums that you can use there. 
But if we want to take that into account in the rule, we can say that you should never force unwrap when you can provide a useful error message or it's not a static developer typo. All right, next rule. You should document all your public methods. As developers, we know that documentation is very good and that we don't do enough of it. We want to help our future selves uh, figure out what, why we did things right now, and also people who come onto our code base. And, but the question is, are you just writing documentation for the sake of writing documentation? Is your documentation actually useful? So one thing that I've seen a lot in a lot of code bases that I work on is something like this, right? Imagine you have a function that creates an item and takes as parameters an author string, a title string, and a length. One common way of doing documentation for this is just to say that the function creates an item, the parameter, the author is the item's author, the title is the item's title, and the length is the item's length. Is this documentation actually useful? Does it help us understand why this function was written in a specific way? I would say no. So if we have this document all public methods, um, best practice, we can extend it to say that only if you should only do it if the documentation, documentation actually adds value and helps explain why you made the mistake. Yeah, why, why it was done the way it was done. Very similar way, we also want to aim for high unit test code coverage. And we know that unit tests are good. Unit tests really help the future cells like do refactorings and prevent regressions. But are the tests actually useful? I think this was more common with Objective-C, but also in Swift, you see a lot of tests sometimes that are, will always pass. This one just checks that the factory creates a, this specific class. And there are many, many pieces of advice on how to write better tests, but I think one fundamental one is to really test things that might actually fail. And you need to, when you write a test, run it and see that it fails to know that it actually brings value. It's not just about exercising a code path. So aim for high unit test code coverage can maybe change to cover a unit's behavior with good unit tests, unit tests that actually test the inputs and outputs and make sure that it behaves the way that it should. All right, the next one will be controversial. Uh, avoiding singletons. So a singleton is one shared instance that's globally accessible. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, okay. One shared instance that's globally accessible. And you'll see a lot of articles about why you should never use singletons. Uh, the pattern sucks, you should never use it, never yeah, avoid it as much as possible. A singleton is very easy to write. Uh, in Swift, uh, all you need to do is create a static initializer for your class, and you have a singleton. Cool. Uh, what's wrong with it? Why is it bad? Um, so the main problem is mutable shared state. So your singleton might be read in one place and changed in another place, and you might not know about it and end up in a very weird situation. It also has an implicit lifetime, so your singleton uh, when you create it, it's, it's going to stay alive for the duration of your app. So in this case, if you had your user data as a singleton, if you, the user logs out, uh, things will not be reset. So that, that would be pretty, pretty bad. Um, singletons are pretty hard to test. So cause, because of this like, globally um, accessible part, they might be created inside the function. Um, and it's very difficult to, to mock. Um, and then it also basically represents an implicit dependency, uh, which is a problem. The thing is, Apple use singletons quite a lot. So we have your application shared as a singleton, user defaults, the standard user defaults, the file managers. Did Apple not read all these blog posts? Did they not know about all these issues that we mentioned? Right. Um, the the way Apple use singletons is to represent single properties of the environment. There should only be one default file manager in your system. There should never be more. So I think if we take that into account and in the way that the system uses singletons, we can expand the avoid singleton rule to say that we should avoid singletons for objects that are not single properties of the environment. All right. 
The alternative to singletons and what makes testing a lot easier is to use dependency injection, which means passing your objects into your methods uh, and being explicit about it. Which is great and it works well in testing. But what if you're working on an open source framework? What if you're working on something that is going to be integrated in an app that you didn't write and you really want the API and integration to be very easy? So I'm going to mention this example, Kingfisher, uh, which is a very popular uh, image downloading and caching framework that's uh, an, on open source. And the way you integrate Kingfisher is very, very simple. You just import it, and then there's, uh, on image view, you do KF set image with URL. And that's it. This API is super simple and really helps the adoption of this framework. You don't have to re-architect your app to get the whatever KF is into your image view. And the way they accomplish that is with the singleton. There is a Kingfisher manager which is shared, which is what the .kf actually interacts with. So if you are writing a framework for, for other people to integrate and you want a really simple API and singletons can help you achieve it, then that's also a valid use case, in my opinion. So avoid singletons for objects that are not single property to environment unless it really improves the API integration of your framework for third party apps. Right. Fifth rule, preferring structs over classes. So pretty fundamental concept for Swift, but structs are value types that get copied around your app. Uh, classes are reference type, and basically a reference, a pointer to the class gets moved around your, whenever you interact with it. In Swift, unlike other languages, there are a lot of similarities between uh, structs and classes. So they can both have uh, stored computer properties, methods, subscripts, initializers, extensions, uh, and protocol conformance for sharing behavior. But structs have a lot of benefits. So again, like there's no shared state because things get copied around. They're generally faster and lighter because they're on the stack. And they're more thread safe, again, because of this copying uh, mechanism. Apple, uh, since Swift 4.2, they tell us that we should use structs by default, which is as like, much of a best practice as you can get. Um, but there are caveats. So there are situations where we can't use structs. Uh, the first one is if we want to interact with Objective-C. For example, if we had this struct of German towns and we wanted to conform it to UI table view data source, that's not going to happen uh, because anything that interacts with Objective-C needs to be a class. Also, we said that you should try and replace singletons with uh, dependency injections, maybe. Uh, but if you do that, structs are not very good for that either, because if we think about the file manager or a Bluetooth manager where there's only one in the system, we want a class for that. We don't want something that gets created again and again. In order to get the benefits that we mentioned of structs, of no shared state and uh, thread safety, it's important that the properties of the structs should be value types too. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate it with this code, for, which is very simple. If we have a struct uh, that has a text, and we create it with a specific text, we create a copy of it, and we change the copy, and we print it out, uh, A text will still be the text that we initialized it with, but B text will be the one that we change it to, which is what we expect with uh, structs getting copied around. However, if we created a class that contained the string, and we use that as a property of our struct, then when we modify it in B, text container, it will also modify the original one. Right. So we don't get this no shared state because both, of, both A and B are pointing to the same text container class. So we should prefer structs over classes, but we should do it when the thing that we represent and its properties have value semantics, and then we get all of the benefits of structs. So we said that stack allocation is very fast, which is great. Um, but we're starting to see issues when we're talking about complex nested structs, because when you copy them, there are a lot of copies that, that need to be created. And that can be quite slow. Apple, in uh, the foundation framework, uh, they use copy on write optimization for arrays, dictionaries, and strings. And what this means is that when the struct gets copied around, the data doesn't get recopied again and again and again until you write it. And when you write, it creates a new copy. You can do this for your code too. 
So um, if we take, again, a very, very simple example of a user name struct, the way we would achieve copy on write here is by creating a storage class. Uh, and then we get this, like, basically the problem that I said before, we get a reference to this class. Uh, and we use that in our struct. And we override the setter and getter of name. And in the getter, we return the name from the storage. But in the setter, we use this method called is known uniquely referenced. And it is known uniquely referenced returns true if there's only a single strong reference to this struct that we created. So if there is only one, we will just set it on it. If there are none or more, we will create a new one. And that helps create this copy and write optimization. So if we modify our rule again, so we should prefer structs over classes when the thing it represents and its properties have value semantics, unless it's a complex nested struct, uh, which has poor performance, and then we should be back, back at that class. Next rule is to use immutable data models. What is the issue with mutable data models? I think this will sound familiar to you at this point, but shared state is the problem. Uh, so if we have a mutable data model, it might get sh changed in one place and not the place that we read it. And that also, also has implications for threat, threat safety. And that means that mutable data models are a bit fragile. You might not react to the changes in the right way. So this should remind you of structs and the conversation from a few seconds ago. And structs are generally pretty good immutable data models. But the problem is often how people interpret that and how people actually implement it. So one thing that I've seen a lot is that because you want to create an immutable data model, you think that the properties should also be let. And then you do this uh, when you want to create a new and you want to change it, you create your own functions that create new versions of the struct. But value types are kind of always immutable unless you have a reference type in one of the properties. So if that's your case, there really isn't any difference with having a var property in your struct. And when you make a change, it gets copied, and it's still immutable. Right. Uh, next rule is not to store things in user defaults. So user defaults is a key value storage. And it's kind of like the simplest <laughs> one that we have on iOS. When you get started, that's probably what you use. And the way you use it is just to do user default standard, set whatever value for a key, and you retrieve it with value for key. As you learn more iOS development, you learn other ways of doing persistence. Uh, and there are many alternatives. You can write to a file. You can write to the keychain, which is good for both. Um, you can use SQLite directly. You can use code data. There are loads and loads of ways of doing persistence in your app. And what often happens is that once you've learned all these other ways, like user defaults seems a bit primitive and seems like the worst thing to use. The main issue people have with user defaults is that it's saved in an unencrypted plist. So if you were to save sensitive user data, it's very easy for a hacker to retrieve it. And another one that's not discussed as much is that there's a performance aspect of it. So when you load uh, user defaults the first time, it basically loads the whole suite into, into memory. So if you saved a lot of stuff in standard user defaults, the first time you access it will be very, very slow. So instead of saying that we should not store things in user defaults, we should say that we should not store a lot of data or anything sensitive in user defaults. And that feels sort of more accurate. Right. Let's zoom out a little bit and talk about the bigger picture. So we said that best practices are this set of informal rules that exists. But how do they develop? How, how do we create new best practices? So I want to take you back to 2016. And there was this uh, blog post by Natasha the Robot, who runs TriSwift and has uh, had a blog and a newsletter. And in it, she described like, an alternative way of using Swift extensions for structuring your code. She started doing that when Swift didn't have Mark, but continued doing it because it made her code a lot easier to reason with. The way it looks like is instead of having everything in your versed class, is to break it down into, you can use Marks as well, but different extensions, and then your code becomes a lot more readable which is a very simple idea. But a lot of people adopted it. And it became something that is kind of a best practice and a lot of people use. 
So that's one way a best practice can be created. Best practices can also change and fall out of favor. One example that I remember is a Swift naming convention. So when we started with Swift, a lot of the APIs were very Objective-C-ish. So if you wanted to uh, append something to a string, you still had this like string by appending string function. And that seemed like the right way of writing, of naming Swift methods. This changed with Swift 3 when Apple published their API design guidelines and said that we should really like prioritize clarity at the point of use and avoiding ambiguity. And then we ended up with uh, something much easier to work with. So just a pen, and, and it does what it does. This was such like a change of best practices that there were a lot of articles, and people call it the great rename, and they felt like they had to rewrite all of the Swift methods to uh, comply with this new best practice way of naming methods in Swift. So if best practices come and go very quickly, are they just like fashions, right? <laughs> Um, in my opinion, best practices are a snapshot right, of what the community currently believes in. This can be a local community, so your colleagues and the people you collaborate with on your code base might have specific ways of doing things, um, specific style guides, etc. Or it can be even as wide as the whole software engineering community. Things like you ain't gonna need it and some like principles that we all, all kind of believe in. Generally, best practices are great general guidelines. So if you're thinking just of one of my examples about never force unwrapping when you can provide a useful error message or it's not a static developer typo, saying never force unwrap is fine. Like You're not going to get any negative consequences just from never force unwrapping anything. For the general case, this is the rule. Uh, but there are specific cases where you might want to do something different. But this is a great guideline. It's what I try to show you by having this sort of like look at different best practices and try and see where they don't hold and where things might be a little different is that it's really important to understand why these best practices exist. And if you understand why, you can become a better developer. Uh, you can not just use best practices as a way to uh, argue your point in code review comments, but you can really explain why they apply in that specific use case. And I think that's a much more powerful story. There's also imposter syndrome associated with best practices. A lot of people who are starting out feel like there's a lot that they need to learn and they need to know, and sometimes even feel bad when they don't follow a specific best practice. And since we've seen that best practices change a lot and are very subjective, that's not as bad. You should not feel this imposter syndrome when you go along. So if we're thinking about best practice as a whole, we're all potential authors of this huge book. And we should not just blindly follow best practices. So I saw this um, tweet yesterday, uh, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, don't do this. <laughs> um, we should challenge best practices and help involve better programming practices for us and our colleagues. Thank you. One. All right, great. Thank you very much. Questions? Do we have questions? Before that, I fire myself. All right, over there. Wait a minute. I'm going to leave the laptop here. Hello. Hi. So, uh, one question is um, uh, this set of best practices, is it uh, your local uh, set, so at Spotify or, or what it is? And the second one about uh, unit testing. Um, yes. you, you said. Um, uh, you should not test uh, really everything, but what about uh, test-driven development? So, uh, is it uh, you know what I mean? Yes, because uh, test-driven development, you should re really write uh, first the, the test case for for every line of the code mm -hmm. that you develop. Um, so, uh, this best practice that you pre presented, uh, it doesn't really. Uh, it doesn't really. Uh, so uh, it's a bit of contradictory to this uh, point, mm -hmm. yes? So two questions. <laughs> All right. So the first one, um, 
it's not like Spotify's best practices, but I, I go to a lot of conferences, I use Twitter, I, use, I listen to podcasts, and I think these are things that I kind of picked up from the community. Um, and then for the second question, so the point that I was trying to make is that you should write tests when they have value. And I don't have a lot of experience with TDD, but when I have used it, all of the tests were valuable. And, and it's not just writing stuff that will always pass. So when you do TDD, you write something that will fail, and then you make it pass. So that's, I think there's not really a contradiction there. Thank you. Um, can I have this mic? There's always a mic I can grab somewhere. Um, next question. Yep, I, I'll grab the mic. It has to come to the front. Try it. You mentioned following Apple best practices that, with the Singleton example, mm -hmm. and it seems like often the community has more. Exp I think the community had more experience with Swift before Apple did. That a lot right. more Swift code was being written outside of, and so as you look at new things like Swift UI, and we've turned things on its head so that the the GUI structs and the models are now classes. Mm -hmm. Do you think some of these best practices evolve depending on what we're writing towards? Yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That was a very short answer. <laughs> don't, uh, don't ask questions where people can answer yes or no. <laughs> I have one question, um, whether you can explain that from Spotify perspective. How, how do you maintain the uh, code guideline in a, a such, a, such a big company, for example? Uh, because you say the best practice is that guy involving and uh, every new developer coming into the, the company, uh, company, for example, Spotify should actually read the guideline first before writing any live codes. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how can you maintain that? Uh, who, who maintains that then? Yeah. So we do have a lot, like a wiki and documentation, and there's like onboarding process where people do learn the rules. But generally, it's best that most of these rules are automated. Um, so we want to have as many linters as possible for these things uh, so that. Yeah, you will learn as you go along, rather than have to memorize uh, a lot of rules and things. All right, over there in the back. Or in the front first. Um, yeah, I had a similar question to the one just now. Um, how mm -hmm. do you, or what is your experience encouraging people to challenge these guidelines, to challenge these back practices, and how do you keep them, like how do you, how do you see them evolve over time? Is that something you have a meeting for with the team? Or how do you make sure that you keep a set of guidelines that is generally agreed upon, but still uh, encourages people to, to challenge mm -hmm. So I think generally it's very good to ask why in code reviews. Um, and I think that's a good practice, and it helps. like really understand if that best practice is needed and if it's valuable. Um, for the linters themselves, like anyone can do a pull request uh, and start like a conversation on whether a specific linter is valuable. Um, yeah, I want to have like an open culture when people can challenge these things. All right, question in the back. We need to have like a like a drone-based microphone. <laughs> Somebody has to come up with that idea. Hello. Um, at our company, some of your best practices are part of a definition of done. <clears throat> and we've got a lot of discussions at our company because uh, some colleagues want to automatically test these uh, definition of done. And uh, as you mentioned, you've, uh, you've got always an exception of a mm -hmm. best practice. And so it's really hard to automatically test. So do you have a recommendation if it's useful or shouldn't we automatically test these uh, these best practices at all? So it depends on the best practice. Um, <coughs> you can always have exceptions, right? Um, it depends what kind of rule it is. I think for something like never force unwrapping, uh, the exceptions are very few. Um, but for other rules, maybe it, it doesn't make sense to automate if it's a very wide range of exceptions. So you need to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks. Yeah. 
Thank you for the great presentation. I just had a question above. You told that just test things that can fail, actually, and you had an example that you said that it's really obvious that's never going to fail. Mm. My question is, that isn't that the point of having these mocks and unit testings, because and also the point that you say that things that can fail and how we can define that things can which can fail. I, I can give you an example. We had in our code actually, we were reading the battery status of the iPhones and the percentage of the battery. Mm -hmm. Actually, we didn't write unit tests for these parts, and we were getting the minus 100 person for some phones. And actually, debugging it was really difficult. And because we don't have unit tests for this, everyone was going to say that no one was complaining that, yeah, battery cannot be less than zero. And we were not, we were not testing it, and we were never checking for this one, and it gave us like a whole sprint headache. Mm -hmm. So my question is that how we can define that things that can go wrong. Anything in the code can go wrong, even though for human it's obvious. So I think things that sh can't go wrong because of the language uh, are like a different category. So in this case that you're describing, uh, it went wrong because you were not familiar with like the API or the desk uh, that you were trying to use, right? It was. We can yeah, interpret it like this, but again, I told. I mean, when you see it, you said I'm getting something from the like this mm -hmm. API. Yeah, exactly. It can never go wrong. It can never be something less than zero, and we just skip it. We never just tested this case. Yeah. It just it skips through our code, and it was later giving us a lot of headaches. So mm -hmm. in the beginning, it was obvious. Yeah, we should never get it, but we were getting there. So we just skip it that one. Yeah, I think. I think my approach would be more. So it depends on what you want to get out of your unit tests. I think if it's about like enabling refactoring and preventing regressions in the future, once you know that this is the behavior of the API and the input that you have, then you can write a test for it and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, but you can't just cover everything 100%. Like 100% line code coverage doesn't actually mean that you're going to catch this, right? It just means that you've exercised that path. So. Thanks. Yeah. Just to. Um, join your question. Uh, we also had this this situation at Ego where we are estimating the when the the the, the bus is coming, and we also mm -hmm. had like at one point uh, um, a code that was saying the bus is coming in in, in minus three minutes, um, which is funny. Um, what is your recommendation on like? Of course, it shouldn't happen, but if it does happen, one of the things that I like to do in this case is to actually crash because then you get like a crash report or something, because the other option is you show zero percent battery, yeah. uh, which is kind of a false positive, right? Mm -hmm. So what should we do on production when we reach that bad point where it actually is bad on production? Yeah. So I think in production you want to crash as little as possible, but if but if you if don't, it's critical, you don't know. yeah. If it's a critical situation. Yeah. You should crash in production. Otherwise, you can assert there, right? And you will get it in debug builds, and yeah. you will know. But uh, in production, only if it's like a state that should never really exist for the users. I don't know what are the implications of having negative time in the in the app. <laughs> well, it's w it's weird. It looks yeah. weird, just right. like battery minus hundred mm -hmm. percent. But also, yeah. you don't actually know in the case of a bus arriving when it will actually arrive. Yeah. So it's it's up to you. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Any further question? Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, I think a lot of your amended best practices <laughs> came out kind of blurry, which is of course natural to happen. But what are your experiences with like drawing a line in the sand, for example, that this is now too much stuff to store in user defaults, and we have to make a cut here? Mm -hmm. When do you do that, and how like do you discuss it with your team at that point that uh, this should be completely overhauled because it's something that just naturally grows and you can't handle anymore? Yeah, so it depends if it's based on like uh, performance. So we measure performance and we generally we look at the time profile and see like where we're spending time. And if there's an issue with any specific part of the code, we can have a discussion about it. Um, yeah, and you just try to build an understanding in the team that it's not necessarily the best idea. But, yeah. All right, next question. I still have one myself. Like uh, different entities defines uh, bad practices and good practices. Mm -hmm. So, like some, for example, sometimes Apple defines some, and yeah. the community defines some, 
and your own company defines others. Mm -hmm. So where do we find a balance, so to say? If they're in conflict or? Well, yeah, <laughs> if they are in conflict, yeah. a lot of time they are, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, so I think, I don't know, in, in the kind of code business that I worked on, when it's a lot of people collaborating, the value of consistency within the code base is, is like the highest thing that you want to work on. But if you work on a smaller code base, um, I think it's, it's more debatable. So okay. yeah, in, in a large code base, it will, I think that what you decide in your local communities is, is the thing that you should hold. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Because if I look at the time, we have another minute or two. So I jump on the next one, which is a very concrete one about the force unwrapping. Um, <laughs> um, like if you have the, the, the typical case where we have, um, we have an API end, endpoint, mm -hmm. and you want to like create a URL out of it, and creating a URL is, is an optional. Um, so you can guard it. Um, and if, if, it, if it's not there, I mean, you're in trouble if your endpoint yeah. is not reachable. That's mm -hmm. the gist of it. So in this case, I also like to crash um, yeah. because, I mean, what else? Um, if you guard it, then you're going to have to present an error to the user and then log some reports, you know, where mm -hmm. I'm going, right? So Yeah, but the URL doesn't fail because it's not reachable, right? It fails because it's not valid. Yeah, that's uh, the point. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, so if it's not valid, you've yeah. made a mistake. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm going to actually like actual developer mistakes. Like yeah. this is where I really love to crash because mm -hmm. you screwed up somewhere as a developer, so you should yeah. crash actually. So yeah, the point I was trying to make that it's okay to crash there, but you need to make sure that that path gets yeah. exercised in your CI, or so that you do get that fast feedback loop. Mm -hmm. If it just crashes in production, mm -hmm. then it's already too late. Okay. So the whole idea to crash is to okay. catch it before. I mean, I also built a framework for like almost two years mm -hmm. that people were using. So when you build a framework, you want to be sure that people are using your framework in the, in the the manner that it's supposed to be used. Right. So that's that's kind of a trickier part mm -hmm. where yeah. You must be responsible for those decisions. All right, um, where's the microphone? Where's the mic? Yeah. <laughs> microphone, where you are. We need AI in the microphones. Thanks. Um, great talk. Uh, I Thanks. wanted to ask, what's your take on uh, implicit unwraps of variables? Um, it's pretty similar to force unwrap. <laughs> um. So shouldn't do it <laughs> um, in general case. In the general case, you shouldn't. Uh, yeah, you should avoid it. Yeah. So let's consider that you're making a, a model for a GraphQL schema. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's not the general case. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Yeah. All right. So I think. Uh, uh, we'll call it finished in this case and give Roy a round of applause. Thank you.